No matter who you are, I'm willing to bet there was a movie, TV episode, or a game that scared the bejesus out of you as a kid. For me, the list of traumatizing media stretched as long as my arm. Not much has changed, honestly, I'm still a scaredy cat. But one thing on that list of terrors had been bugging me for years. For the longest time, I had these foggy memories of watching a PewDiePie Let's Play. He was playing this horror game that filled me with this unparalleled sense of dread. I couldn't describe it accurately at the time, but I think this was one of the first games games to ever actually oh disturb me. And even though I couldn't remember the game PewDiePie played, the feelings it implanted stuck with me for years. Fast forward like 11 years, I had started uploading some of the most YouTube content ever myself. And PewDiePie had some sort of incident on a bridge or something, I don't really know. What a fucking- During my daily brain rot session on Instagram Reels, I came across a video of a game that looked vaguely familiar, and then BAM, everything clicked. All the repressed memories came flooding back, and now I could put a name to the game that caused me so much distress all those years ago, Siren Blood Curse. I just knew I had to make a video about this game. The fact that I came across this title after all these years feels like fate. It's time to face my fears. I'm a grown ass man now. Mom said I'm allowed to play M-rated games. Surely, this game can't be as disturbing as I remember, right? Quick note before the rest of the video, I want to give a shout out to Super Retroland on Instagram. His page is where I not only found Siren Blood Curse, but also Obscure. And full disclosure, if I see another cool game on his account, I'll probably talk about that one too. Siren Blood Curse released in 2008, developed from a small team within Japan's studio, Project Siren. Blood Curse is actually the third game in the Siren series. Why am I making a video about the third game instead of starting with the first two? Uh... Published by Sony for the franchise's entire lifespan, Blood Curse would be the final chapter in the Siren series. Funnily enough, this game was mainly geared towards a western audience, and so it's the only game in the series I've heard of, so it worked on my honky ass. One of the scariest experiences this game can offer is figuring out how to play the damn thing. For starters, it ain't on Steam or any digital stores for that matter, so you know what that means. Fire up that emulator and pray to the dark gods that you can get this game running. If this video ends up being a day or two late, it's because I spent a day or two in emulation purgatory getting this thing going. And even then, it's not perfect. There's still visual glitches and this annoying bug where the cutscenes would cut off early. It made understanding the story a pain, but it occasionally provided some unintentional comedy. <laughs> Young Thug Blood Curse is told through the eyes of multiple protagonists, eight of them to be exact. If you think switching between eight characters would get confusing, you'd be right. We're just thrown straight into the fray without much explanation. We play through the tutorial section as Howard. Who in their right mind names their kid Howard? If your name is Howard bro, just unsub from my channel immediately. Your kind isn't welcome here. We use Howard to learn the controls in the tutorial section. The word learn is doing a lot of heavy lifting here. You more so grit your teeth and bear for the entire game. The camera is claustrophobically close. You're not seeing more than 30 degrees around you at any given time. There is a first person mode, but that's only really good for making you motion sick, so just stick to third person. I know I just kind of ragged on the controls, but I actually don't hate it. Don't get me wrong, it's absolute BS at times. It wouldn't be a Japanese game without backwards ass controls. But I think it works strangely well with the gameplay. It makes sense to have your vision and movement restricted in a horror game. Combined with how dark the levels are, you'd be lucky to see three feet in front of you. Well, since we can barely rely on traditional sight to get around, we gotta use something a bit more supernatural. Sight jacking. It's on sight the way I be jacking. Sight jacking allows the player to see through the eyes of nearby NPCs, both friendly and hostile. This mechanic adds a ton to the gameplay, while also being a major pain in the ass at times. There is something genuinely unnerving about looking through the eyes of the person who wants you dead, watching as they shamble closer and closer to your hiding spot. This feature also makes the game run like shit whenever you use it. I can only imagine people's PS3s screaming in pain at having to run two instances of the game simultaneously. Simultaneously. This feature is such a double-edged sword. On one hand, it can vastly improve the immersion of the game and amplify the fear the player might be feeling. On the other hand, it activates automatically anytime you get spotted by an enemy. 
And now half your screen is obscured and the game is running about as well as Arma 3. That's a running theme you'll notice with this game, every aspect somehow enhances and hinders the experience to a certain extent. I doubt this was intentional, I think the devs were just going through it heavy having to develop a game for the PS3. A perfect example of what I mean can be found with the combat. Every character can fight back against the enemies by picking up makeshift weapons they find around the level. Except for Bella. I guess cause she's just a kid or something like that. That's a crock of shit in my opinion. If these characters are supposed to be American, she'd have her own open carry permit and a full auto glock on her at all times. Being able to attack the enemies constantly harassing you feels great when you're able to. However, this also pretty much instantly kills any fear or suspense that the level might have had. At the start of the level, I'm sneaking around and hiding, fearing for my life. The second I find any gardening equipment though, I'm taking it to the skull of every NPC I see. This game goes from Outlast to Doom in like 4 seconds. This is amplified even more so during the missions where you have access to guns. I don't know where they got those, maybe they're in the same area as the guy that murked Shinzo Abe. Speaking of areas, there's like 5 or 6 spread across the 12 levels or episodes as the game refers to them, so you're gonna be replaying a bunch of these levels multiple times. Is this a bad thing? Maybe? On paper, replaying to the same levels multiple times sounds absolutely mind-numbing and repetitive, but I never felt that way while playing. I think this mainly comes down to how the game just throws you into the deep end most of the time. In the beginning, you have no way of knowing how to navigate any of these areas, all the while pissing yourself running away from Shibito. But as you come back to the levels later on in the game, you slowly start to familiarize yourself with the layout of each area. Coming to learn the layout of the maps is a strangely satisfying experience. The backdrop of Blood Curse is a setting that I haven't seen explored enough in the horror genre, that being the rural Japanese countryside. The only other piece of horror media I could think of is a short film on YouTube called My House Walkthrough, which gives off an extremely similar sense of dread as Siren Blood Curse. As someone who's been to the Japanese countryside in the past, there is this strange sense of isolation you feel once you're out there. The people I met in the countryside were all extremely kind and welcoming, nothing like the hospitality on display from the residents of Hanuda. Even though I knew I was completely safe, there's still just an eerie sense about the area. This eerie feeling is cranked up to 100 in the game's environments. Even when you have the ability to protect yourself from danger, it's hard to ever feel safe. Feeling danger constantly works great for a horror game, although this feeling is greatly diminished as the game goes on. By chapter 8, you'll just be darting through each level looking at Google Maps the whole time. One thing Japan Studio did incredibly well is the overall art and atmosphere of the game. The enemy designs later in the game get pretty horrific and unsettling. The designs feel super creative, something about bug people just gets under my skin. There's so much imagery in the game that is super disturbing, but combined with the oppressive darkness in some levels, I just felt super uneasy while playing it. This is one of the best atmospheres I've experienced in a horror game. I just wish they nailed the level design as much as they did the visual design. As much as I enjoyed my time with Siren Boob Curse, I gotta keep it real with the Japan Studio, the last three chapters of the game are straight dog shit. By this point in the typical playthrough, most people have probably stopped feeling any real sense of fear at this point. The developers probably knew this too. It would explain why the amount of BS the game throws at you towards the end spikes to an insane degree. For example, there's a part late into the game where we have to retrieve an ancient artifact thingy from an abandoned mine. Guarding the artifact is a gigantic maggot Shibito who straight up refuses to die. I tried setting like 3 traps to slow it down, but I guess it just bee hopped over them? If you have the gall to climb the ladder to reach the artifact, you get one shot instantly. At this point, your objective updates to killing the brain Shibito to disable the maggot. Brain Shibitos are usually enemies that look visually distinct from the others, and once they're dealt with, the other Shibitos fall dead too. I, well, at the beginning of the level, there was the Shibito that wouldn't leave me the hell alone, and she had these weird things coming out of her eyes, so she's gotta be our brain baddie, right? Well, yeah, except once you actually need to kill her, she's nowhere to be found. The only way to get her to appear is to shut down the mine's elevator for whatever reason. There is legit zero explanation as to why you need to do this. I wouldn't have figured it out without this godsend of a walkthrough. I think I would rather be ritually sacrificed than have to endure this level again. There's a ton of other examples that I could go over, but you get the picture. If you're looking to play this game for yourself, just get ready to endure the insane amount of shenanigans you'll have to deal with towards the end. If the final few hours of the game are a complete slog, why did I bother finishing it? Mainly out of interest for the story. Well, 
that and I'm under constant threat of a drone strike if I don't upload regularly. Like I stated before, we jump around to different perspectives from each different character. Some are at different locations at separate times, and some have opposing motivations to the character we just played as. So off the bat, I knew this game was going to be as convoluted as every other Japanese game I seem to play. For the first few hours, we share a similar perspective to that of the characters, just genuine fear and confusion. Only through playing the campaign and repeating the same levels do we actually start to piece the puzzle together. Eventually, everything starts to make sense, is what I would say if I could fully understand the story. I can see what the devs were going for with Siren's narrative. Having the player slowly put the story together over the course of the game would feel hella satisfying, and it kinda did to be honest. But I only got like 90% of the way there. I read what archive entries I had, and also did some digging around online once I finished the game. I'm gonna attempt to explain the story through what I learned. I would say spoilers, but I honestly don't even know if what I'm saying is legit or not. So watch at your own risk, and feel free to scream at me in the comments if I get anything wrong. The story begins with the characters Sam, Melissa, their daughter Bella, and the camera guy Sol. They came to this abandoned village of Hanuda to shoot an investigative documentary about supposed paranormal events occurring there. They clearly get the content they're looking for as they witness a sacrificial ritual about to take place. The ritual is disrupted by our boy Howard, who saves the would-be sacrifice named Miyako. In the ensuing chaos, all the characters get separated and have to try to regroup with one another, while also trying not to get slurped up by the zombie-like Shibito that appeared. I guess you could argue that the main character of the game is Howard. Mainly because he manages to cheat death multiple times, he's the one who's protecting Miyako from being sacrificed, and you also later learn that he's the chosen one. Bro goes to Japan once and he has to kill God, SMH. It's later revealed that all of the characters are trapped in a time loop, a loop that the mysterious Amana is trying to break by summoning an interdimensional bug god completely understandable. As you progress through the campaign, you play as each character and meet some new ones too, like Saiga. He's my favorite character because his voice actor is fighting for his damn life reading these English lines. You were part of that ritual. That's how it's curved, you know. He's also afraid of women it seems. Eventually, the characters all become insane or shibitos themselves, forcing the time loop to reset and go through the whole ordeal again. This time though, Howard and Sam meet up. We learn that Howard received a cryptic email from Sam telling him to come to the village. Sam looks at him like he's schizo because he has no recollection of ever doing such a thing. Miyako is successfully sacrificed in this loop too, summoning the god Kaiko. Howard's the chosen white boy though, so with the help of Spirit Miyako, we beat Kaiko in a boss battle that was honestly way cooler than I was expecting. They really went all out with the final fight, and it shows. With the mandatory killing of God in every Japanese game, our characters are scattered through time. It seems like Howard is trapped in some sort of time thing where he's forced to kill Shibito forever. He seems pretty stoked about it though, so it's all good. Howard was sent back to Hanuda in 1976, right after the village was destroyed due to a landslide. Realizing this, he vows to keep the time loop going in order to save Bella. Through reading the extra archive items, we can infer that Bella was sent way back in time. She somehow came across the corpses of Kaiko, and ate that motherfucker cause she was starving. Still sounds more appealing than Arby's honestly. She gained immortality from this, and is implied to become a mana after enough time. After all these years, I'm insanely happy I could find this game again. It's far from perfect, but Siren Blood Curse has got to be one of the most memorable games I've played in a while. There's so much good here that I feel like this game is begging for a remake. Could you imagine how much more unsettling this game could be on modern hardware? Game studios seem to be dead set on relying on reboots and remakes for new games, so the fact that this game hasn't been given the attention it deserves is a crime. Maybe we can sacrifice a couple of people to speed things along. You know, whatever works. 